If you are here for judging a book by its cover, how inclusive is your community, then you are in the right place. There's supposed to be a picture here. And I don't know why it's not showing up. It's okay, we have to do this. <laughs> so hello, I am Alana Burke. Um, you can find me on drupal.org or Twitter at aburke626. And you can find me on Slack, where I'm also an admin, at Alana Burke. So today we're going to talk a lot about how welcoming open source communities are, and we're also going to talk about the Drupal community. So do you think that people feel welcomed in the Drupal community? You know, has anyone here, you know, raise your hand, have you ever had or witnessed an unwelcoming experience? in the Drupal community. Yeah, so that's more than half of the people in this room. And that's not great. What about open source in general? Have you ever witnessed or experienced an unwelcoming experience in an, in an open source project in general? Yeah, again, that's almost everyone in the room. That's really bad. And the numbers also say that people don't feel welcome in open source. So GitHub did this big open source survey in 2017. And I just wanna point out a few really, numbers that I thought were really important. So 18% of respondents had experienced a negative interaction in open source. 50% of respondents witnessed a negative interaction. 21% of respondents stopped working on a project because of a negative experience. That's one in five people who stopped working on a project because of something they experienced while working on it. Over 50% of respondents encountered dismissive responses. And that's a huge one. That's something I've definitely encountered from the first time I ever asked a question about how to install Linux on my laptop when I was in college, to even today as someone who knows a lot of people and generally, unfortunately, that's something that gets you a little more respect in the Drupal community, but I still sometimes ask a question or raise an issue in an issue queue and I still get a won't fix or works as designed or this isn't worth it and someone closes an issue. And I think, really, you're gonna, you're gonna be like that? But a lot of people are just like that. And that's not okay. So there were also a lot of questions about like what's important to you in a project and you know what do you think really matters in a project. So 67% of respondents said that the license is very important when deciding whether to contribute to a project. So they wanted to know, you know, how is this code going to be used, who can use it, and how are we controlling that? Um, and when it came to you know what's in the project. And, you know, what do you see in the project? 93% of respondents observed incomplete or missing documentation. And documentation is really important because when you come into a project, you need to know how to use it. <laughs> you know, what, what is this code? How does it work? What does it do? What am I supposed to do with it? So I thought that those numbers were really striking and I, I wanted to point them out. I came across this really great quote um, on a post uh, by a Hoodie on, uh, it was about welcoming communities. A lot of people enjoy contributing to open source projects and open source projects love contributions. And yet I keep seeing newcomers struggling to contribute and project maintainers struggling to find contributors. So what's the catch? 
And I think this is the question that we're constantly asking. We, we have all of these people who want to contribute, and we have all of these people who are begging people to contribute. So why, why is this a problem? It, it should be the solution to its own problem, and yet it's not. So clearly there's a problem here that we aren't finding and we aren't addressing. And I think the issue is that open source isn't welcoming. It isn't inclusive. And the people who want to help don't know how, and they're scared, and they don't feel like they'll be accepted. And that is the problem that we have to fix. So what makes an open source community welcoming? I did a lot of research and a lot of looking around and a lot of digging into my own experience. And this is certainly not an end-all, be-all list. But I identified a handful of things that I think are really important and certainly the best to start at making sure that your open source community is welcoming. So you need a good code of conduct. That is number one. You cannot go anywhere without a good code of conduct. If you want to start an open source project, when you initialize your repository, you should make a code of conduct. You shouldn't go anywhere else first. You should make a git ignore file, a readme, and a code of conduct. Your events and speakers. What are your events? How are you organizing them? And who's speaking at them? Because who's on stage matters. These people are gonna to go to your events, they're going to see who's on stage, and they're going to assume, very rightly, that the people on stage are important to your project. And if they don't see people important who look like them and that they can identify with, then they won't feel that they're welcomed in your community. And of course, very sensibly, the ease of entry and the ease of contribution in your project. If people cannot contribute to your project, they're not going to feel welcome to do so. If they can't figure out how to do it, they are not going to do it. There's, of course, accessibility, which covers a wide range of things from your tech accessibility. You know, can someone actually access your project on the internet and use it? to sort of the more general things that could span from your, you know, are your events accessible to, um, you know, how you make, um, you know, make your, your project and your existence accessible. And we'll talk a little more about that. Your leadership, your project has to be led by someone. Do they, seem welcoming? How do they run your project? Um, do they look like welcoming people? Do they look like the people you want to contribute to your project? Your website and social presence. You know, someone has to find your project and find information about it in order to contribute. They have to communicate with other people in order to contribute. Does your website and social presence lend itself to that? And mentorship and documentation. If someone is new to your project, they need to talk to someone to learn how to contribute. They need to read documentation to learn how to contribute to your project. Do you have that in place for new people? So let's start by talking about a good code of conduct. Do you have a good, solid code of conduct that is prominently published and easy to find? Do you have things like an anti-harassment policy? Is it clear how you handle conflict? A code of conduct is the most important thing in your community. It has to be robust. Don't worry that you're being too specific or feeling like you're being catastrophic because if you're too broad, you might regret it later. You may want to supplement your code of conduct with things like an anti-harassment policy, which should be very specific, an anti-discrimination policy, which should make it clear that you do not tolerate any forms of discrimination. And you also need to have a separate events code of conduct, much like DrupalCon does, to make it very clear what behaviors you do and do not tolerate at events in person. And also a value and ethics statement 
um, can help outline what the values of the community are and what values your community is expected to embrace. I think it can really help the community get an idea of like, you know, this is what we as a community want to strive for. This is the kind of people we want to be. And, you know, if you've got people in the community that aren't the kind of people you want to be, I think it can give them an idea that like, hey, maybe you aren't the kind of people we want to have here. And I think it just sort of makes things a little clearer. Leadership. This is really important, and I think this is a place where tech specifically struggles. What does your leadership look like? Because diversity starts at the top. It does not start at the bottom. Are your leaders all white? Are your leaders all men? And look at the breakdown of your leadership. Are all the technical roles men? One of the things I do whenever I am looking at a company or a project is, you know, to look at their leadership page or to look at their, you know, their team page and I look at the breakdowns. And sometimes I look at the overall gender breakdown or the overall, um, you know, breakdown of people of color is okay until I look at their roles. And then I see that everyone who isn't a white man is in some kind of support role. You know, they're not the developers. And this especially happens in leadership, where all of the technical roles are men, and then everyone who isn't technical is a woman. And that isn't really progress, because women are just as technical, and women are just as capable. So if all of your support roles go to women, you're still not getting it right. Official versus unofficial leadership is a really tricky topic. It's something you have to be really mindful of this. So in open source, people who work publicly on your project are going to emerge as leaders. People who contribute a lot, people who speak at your events, people who have a lot of knowledge. So you need to be aware of these people and be aware of what kind of people they are. Are they warm, welcoming, kind, and helpful? Or are they toxic, rude, and dismissive? Are these unofficial leaders the people that you would choose as leaders in your community? This is a really tough one, but toxic leaders in your community are often a really huge issue in open source projects, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And there isn't really a one, you know, solution fits all kind of, of answer here. Um, and I think each community really has to look at this and see what their specific problems are and how they're affecting their community. But, you know, talking to their leaders, you know, figuring out maybe we do want to have some more official leadership. Um, but it's, it's something that we can't just sweep under the rug. So some ways to help address it are, um, you know, hopefully you've already created a code of conduct and an anti-harassment policy to address the very specific behaviors coming from any toxic unofficial leaders. If not, rewind, create a committee, and do that. With those in place, you should better be able to address this. But first you have to define a goal. What, what do you actually want to do? Do you want to change the behavior of these people? Do you think that that's possible? Do you think that that is fixable? Do you think that you can repair the relationships in this community? Or do you wanna ask this person to step back? Do you think that you can ask them to step down or leave the community? You should also ideally have someone in your leadership trained in mediation and prep to do this. If not, you need to bring in some kind of professional. This only gets worse if you have inexperienced and untrained people trying to address this. Then you've got a snafu, potentially legal problems, and it's not how you want to move forward. Next up, let's talk about events and speakers. So what makes an event inclusive? First off, accessibility. 
It should be obvious, but there is so much that events need to do. If you look on Twitter, you can find thousands of threads about event accessibility, from wheelchair access to meals, quiet and prayer rooms. Be aware of all of the things that your community needs. Child care, nursing rooms, there's a huge list. And communicate what will and will not be available. People understand that not every event can afford to do every single thing for every single person. But it's most important that people come to your event or don't come to your event because they know exactly what you can and cannot provide. Don't let them get to your event and then find out. And also, how easy is it to get to your conference? How expensive is it? Do you always hold it in the same city? Do you have scholarships? Do you pay funds up front? Or do you reimburse them at some magical later date? Do you help with visas and other paperwork? That stuff really matters. How people can actually get to your events. You know, plane travel isn't magic. People have to pay for it. They have to figure out how they're going to do all of those logistics. And the more that you can help with that, the more you can ensure that you have a wide range of people going to your events and not just the people who are privileged enough to have employers who can do all of that for them. Speakers. Speakers are the people who make up your events. And no matter what you do, if you don't have a speaker lineup that doesn't look like your community, your community will be perceived as your speaker lineup. So if your speaker lineup is predominantly white and male, your community will be perceived as predominantly white and male. So do whatever you can to make your speaker lineup as diverse as possible. This goes especially for keynotes because your keynotes will be the most advertised. They are the most special pieces of your event. There is no excuse to have an all white or all male lineup of keynote speakers, never. And I never want to hear an event say they're all we could find, they're all who were available. You didn't try. After hour social events are another really important thing. Do they all revolve around drinking? That's not very inclusive. Lots of people just don't drink, don't want to drink, don't want to get drunk with a bunch of strangers, don't feel comfortable around a, around a bunch of strangers who are drinking. It doesn't matter why, you don't get to ask why, just try to have events that don't revolve around alcohol. Are all of your events really loud? People get tired of that, it's not a great way to have conversation. So consider having some more relaxed, alcohol-free socials like board games with food and social, uh, food and soda. Do remember that tech events are a whole bunch of nerds. Board games with pizza and soda are probably really just fine with everybody at your event. Not to stereotype, but I don't really know that many people who would be super bummed out if that was one of many options. And make sure that your events code of conduct is strictly applied to any and all social events stemming from your event. Your marketing. Make sure that your marketing is also inclusive. Don't try to make the event look like something that it isn't, but if you do have a diverse lineup and diverse attendees, show them in your marketing materials. Advertise your inclusive events. Communicate all of the accessible options at your conference. Let people know what you're doing. Let's talk about your website and your social presence. What do people see when they visit you online? They should see the really important things. Your code of conduct, which should also show them a page that includes anything about how to report conflict or issues. You should show them how to contribute. Open source is about contribution. So this should be front and center on open, any open source project page. You should also show who contributes. 
you want folks to get an idea of who else is in the community. This is a community that they're going to join. You know, not showing people who contributes is like asking people to join a club that they don't know who any of the members are. So I think it's really important that people have a sense of who else is in this community before they commit to it. Social media is a really important part of communication these days. So do you have clear social media policies, clear commenting policies? You know, people are going to be rude and nasty and negative to you on Twitter. It doesn't matter if you are the Ego Waffles account or an open source project. Someone is going to be mean and rude to you. Do you have policies about how you handle that? Because you need those. And do you have policies about you know, how you respond to people? Do you have a good social media team that is well-informed and you know, helping people who ask you questions? You should also have an idea of what kind of persona you want your social media to have. You do not have to have an overly friendly social media account, but do have an idea of the kind of vibe that you want to be. It is totally fine to be dry and informative, but just make sure that you're consistent so people have an idea of what to expect. Ease of entry and contribution. How easy is it for people to contribute to your project? Open source is about contribution, so it should be as easy as possible to get started contributing to your project. Make sure you have a path to contribution for everyone for developers, for inexperienced developers, and for non-developers. Documentation is important, and it's a valid way to start contributing. A lot of people, you know, they start to look at a project and they realize there isn't documentation. Well, creating that documentation as you figure it out is a really great way. I find myself doing this a lot when I'm, you know, starting a new project. Um, you know, at a company, and I'm like, oh, none of this setup documentation is here. So as I get my setup done, I write the documentation, and my first commit back to the project is usually all of the setup documentation for the setup that I just did. Include environment setups in your contribution setup and keep it easy. You know, remember that not everyone is experienced with DevOps. A lot of people do not know how to spin up a local environment, so don't assume that they do. You know, at least include a link to a very good how-to and not just like, oh, hey, you know, just install such and such on your computer and then do this. A lot of people don't know how to get to the such and such part. And don't gatekeep contribution. Don't make people jump through hoops. Let people contribute. And if their contribution is bad, you can point them toward mentorship resources and documentation before accepting it. That's what pull requests are for. We already have a system for bad contributions. Don't keep people from submitting their bad contributions. So some ways to make sure it's easy for people to contribute. Tag issues specifically for new contributors. Tag quick fixes, the things that are 30 minutes or less. And tag documentation that needs to be added or improved. patient and kind in issue cues. You were a newbie once too. Be nice. Rudeness, dismissiveness, and unresponsiveness are some of the main reasons that people do not contribute. So don't tolerate anyone who is any of those things in the issue cues. There's never a reason to be rude. Tone can be difficult online. I personally tend toward being overly polite and overly friendly because I don't want anyone to misinterpret my tone. You don't have to do that, but you do have to avoid being rude and dismissive and unresponsive. Mentorship and documentation. A good community supports itself and the people who make it up. This includes mentoring, and ensuring everything is documented properly. So, is your community clicky? I know a lot of communities have been accused of that. 
do people feel like they can talk to the existing contributors? Or do they feel like that's some really cool social club that they don't have access to? And do mentors reach out to new contributors to new contributors or you know have them actually do some of the work? How proactive are you in bringing in new folks? Do you reach out to them or do you just assume that people are going to reach out to you? Everything needs to be documented, not just the code. Document how to contribute, how to mentor, document how to add documentation. All the documentation has to be in the same place. It should be clean, clear, it should be searchable. Open source code is only as good as its documentation. What good is code if people do not know how to use it? And then there's accessibility. We could give an entire talk, and I have, on accessibility, but a good community supports itself and the people who make it up. This goes from everything to codes of conduct, to mentoring, to documentation, to your events. Do research, reach out, and make sure that everything you do is with humans in mind and with the needs of the humans in your community. There's no point in writing code if you don't think about the humans that the code is for and the other humans who are writing the code. Sometimes we think too much about the code and the machines and we don't think about the other people. And I think that's a big shortcoming of tech and of projects is that we sort of, you know, we, we lose the forest for the trees and we need to step back and look at the community again. Because if we're not thinking about the community and the people and all of their needs and sort of the, the greater idea of accessibility and not just accessibility as, you know, ARIA tags, we're really losing some of, of what we need. You know, accessibility is everything from making sure that we have food that everybody can eat to the, um, you know, the sign language translators to making sure that the signage is you know, big enough that everybody can read it, to making sure that you have color contrast to, that everyone can read, to making sure that we have wheelchair access, to making sure that, you know, people have, can get scholarships and that we're, you know, giving tickets to speakers. Everything about making sure that you can get people in the room and that they understand what's going on, that you can get people working on the project and that there's no barriers. It's about breaking down barriers. So just keep that in mind in everything that you're doing. So the next thing that I did was I took a look through a handful of popular open source communities to see how they sort of fulfilled the handful of things that I just broke down. Um, all that I did was look through their websites and Googled. I didn't use any of my contacts. I didn't shout out on Twitter to say, hey, do you know if such and such community has such and such? I didn't do anything like that. Um, I didn't, I probably dug deeper than the average person would, but I didn't use anything that they wouldn't have available to them. So let's see how they stack up. So here's WordPress. Um, their community link is make.wordpress.org and they're on Twitter at WordPress. So their code of conduct, there is no link to their code of conduct on their homepage. They do have an events code of conduct, but if they have a community code of conduct, I cannot find it. They have a stack exchange code of conduct. They have a code of conduct template for events and meetups. And I found a proposed community code of conduct. But it's a pretty short, pretty big shortcoming. Um, I could not find anything about how the project is governed or project leadership. Um, there's a link to Matt Mullenweg's blog, but that's it. There's nothing about how the actual project is governed or led. Um, as far as events and speakers, WordCamp US is cheap and focuses a lot on accessibility from food and allergies to nursing rooms and childcare. They even provide sanitary products in the restrooms at conferences, so that was pretty nice. Um, the website and social presence, 
Uh, their website's pretty good. I don't have anything negative to say about it, but there's really no sense of the community as a whole. It's very much about like WordPress, the thing, the project, and nothing about the people that make it up. For ease of entry and contribution, there is a nice get involved link on the homepage. So pretty easy paths to contribution. Couldn't really find a whole lot about accessibility other than they do seem to um, be pretty aware of it. So I think, um, like I meant to put something in there that they, they've done a pretty good job of it. And I think their documentation is pretty extensive and easy to read. I didn't really find much about mentorship specifically. So WordPress, aside from not having a specific code of conduct, I think WordPress is doing an all right job overall. I would probably do stuff in the WordPress community. If, you know, if I was thinking, hey, I want to contribute to WordPress and this is what I found, I would probably ask about their community code of conduct first. But other than that, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, Kubernetes is another really big one. Um, this is their community page at kubernetes.io slash community. They do have a very prominent code of conduct and they are on Twitter. Oh, yikes, my text went off the thing. Um, so they have a prominent link on their community page to their code of conduct. I found absolutely nothing about their leadership anywhere. Their events and speakers were sort of, it was hard to find anything because there's a lot of like different like Kubernetes events all over the place, so I couldn't really find any like official events. Um, so that was kind of tricky. The website and social presence, they're, it's like pretty jargon filled, so if you didn't already know stuff about it, I think you would be pretty like put off. Um, it wasn't very like inviting, like, hey, come learn about Kubernetes and like do stuff with us. Social media was pleasant and informative. There's a contribute button in, the, button in the homepage footer. Couldn't really find anything about accessibility. Wasn't really much out there. Again, it was all very like, their website was pretty technical. Um, mentorship and documentation, didn't really find anything about mentorship, but they had a lot of documentation. So this was a very like technical. So unless I was technical and I already knew what I was doing, this would probably put me off which is already kind of my feeling about Kubernetes, was like, I don't really know much about it, so I'm just gonna not do anything with it. <laughs> Mozilla. So, mozilla.org, and this is the sort of long link to their code of conduct, which is like, they call it their like participation policy, but it's very much a code of conduct. They have a very prominent link to their code of conduct on their community homepage. Their leadership, they have the Mozilla Corp and Foundation, um, that's all laid out very well. Um, they have quite a bit of gender diversity in their leadership, but it's still very white. Um, events and speakers, they have a ton of like free and low cost events that are online and around the world. So I thought that was pretty good. They have like this huge event list that ranges from like small meetups to bigger things. And I had to do some research because they're all presented in their local currency. And some of them I thought were thousands of dollars, but they were actually thousands of rupees, which was like $12. So I was like, oh, hey, look, these are really cheap. This is great. Um, website and social presence, they have extensive websites and social media, all of which I found pretty welcoming, very inviting. They, um, they actually, um, for ease of entry and contribution, they use the term volunteering a lot, which I thought was nice. You don't really see that in the open source world. We use the word contributing a lot. Mozilla uses the word volunteering more, which I thought was kind of nice. It brings it more, um, you get more of a nonprofit well, I mean, and the Mozilla org is a nonprofit, but so are most open source projects. But um, it gave it more of a traditional nonprofit kind of a feel, like, hey, come work with us. And they very much had a lot of non-code stuff, like that they made very prominent, like come volunteer at events, help us run events, and I, I really liked that. Um, so they have very detailed paths on how to contribute and how to volunteer. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I think I accidentally copied the same thing into accessibility, but they, they're very focused on accessibility, all kinds of stuff. Um, and they had tons of documentation, and tons of help, like Mozilla A+. I actually, looking at this, I was like, I could work with Mozilla. Like, this is, I'm pretty into, like, how they presented everything. It was really good. So I felt like that was a very welcoming community. And then we have Linux. There's Linux.org. And it turns out Linux does have a code of conduct. I had to Google to find that. 
it lives in the Linux kernel. It's, um, they recently adopted the contributor covenant. It was hotly debated. The Linux people didn't like it. Linus Torvald decided they were going to have a code of conduct, though, so he committed it, and then they had one. Um, it's impossible to find. Uh, Linux doesn't have a nice website of all of their documentation. They have um, Linux.org is just a forum. Uh, so the code of conduct is just like nested in folders in inside their Git repository. So I had to like find the link to that. So that was great. It is the contributor covenant, which is fine. So like I will give them points for that, but. It doesn't even, it worries me that like people aren't even adopting it if they're like against it. Like you can't just like militantly give your project a code of conduct and say like now we have a code of conduct if people aren't going to agree to it. And you also can't just bury it deep in your code and just assume that people are going to find it. The leadership of the Linux Foundation is so overwhelmingly white and male it's depressing. Uh, events and speakers run by the Linux Foundation are very expensive. They do offer scholarships, um, but they're very expensive. Like I said, Linux.org is just a forum. The Foundation has social media. The project does not. Like, the project itself doesn't... It's so very old school. Like No social media, no website. They just do their stuff. Ease of entry and contribution makes me want to cry. It's impossible. It's designed as such. They have this whole rigmarole where you have to like email someone and they send you some tests and you have to like pass all of these coding tests and things, except that that's not even available anymore because they don't want any new contributors. So you literally cannot contribute to Linux right now. Nothing about accessibility, no mentorship, and any documentation is again buried inside of the actual repository of the Linux kernel. So good luck with that. And then there's Drupal. So let's see how Drupal stacks up. We, of course, know it's Drupal.org. Drupal.org slash DCOC is our code of conduct. And we have many different Twitter accounts. The Drupal project Twitter account is just Drupal. We have a link to our code of conduct in the footer. So it's very easy to find. And we also have an event code of conduct. If you go to the code of conduct page, there is a sidebar with a bunch of stuff about governance and other information. Our leadership. Um, our structure is fairly typical and clear to anyone who cares to look. The Drupal Association is a nonprofit with a board of directors. Dries is on that board. Events and speakers. DrupalCon is expensive. It's held in Western countries. We don't pay our speakers. And while we do have scholarships, they are a reimbursement strategy, which doesn't really help people get on the plane. However, the track teams have been making great strides in diversifying the speaker list. The DrupalCon event staff has been improving the conference in terms of general accessibility, prayer rooms, quiet rooms, pronoun stickers, no photography lanyards, and things like that. So I do think that our events are of a fairly high quality, but um, I think we could do a lot better. We have a very informative website and a good social media presence with a good social staff. I don't know anything about our specific um, policies because I, it's not my job, so I don't work for them, but um, I think they do a pretty good job from the interactions that I've had and observed. We have a contribute button fairly prominently on the homepage. Um, I think those paths, if, if you follow them, are pretty good in terms of, you know, contribution paths. Um, accessibility is a pretty major initiative and focus both on the technical side, and I think people are really realizing on the human side that it's very important, um, certainly from the event staff and groups like Drupal Diversity and Inclusion, I think we're really trying to make that um, a, much, um, a much more prominent um, focus in general in the community. And we have you know, the mentor initiative for mentorship, um, which I think is fantastic. You know, we have contrib days at almost every single event with, with mentored sprints, which I think is, I, mean, I can't imagine we could do much more in terms of that. Um, you know, there's, there's mentorship on Slack. Um, I think, you know, like I said at the beginning, I think if there's a gap that exists, it's because the more general community may not feel welcoming. I don't think it's because we're not trying hard enough with mentorship. And documentation, you know, has its own home on Drupal.org. Of course, there is always missing documentation, but as an overall documentation arch architecture, I think we're doing a really good job there.
So um, I forgot to put the final slides in here, um, but if you have any questions, we can do some Q&A. Don't forget to go to the sprints. Um, and if you want to review this, you have to go through the app and then tap on the, the review link and then it lets you review it because we can't review them on the website. So that's it. And we have like one minute if there's any questions. <laughs> Thank you for bringing up the, um, we were talking about how people see your projects, and I was thinking about that more also from like a personal perspective, how do people see me or, 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 or you know, how do we present ourselves, you know, individually, and, and I thought that I could relate to that as well, so thank you. That was all. Yeah. If you want to comment on that, I, uh, I don't know. No, I think it's important. It's something I think about too. Like, I think I've been put in, you know, through, you know, GDI and being a speaker and being on the truck team, I think I've been sort of put in one of those positions of unofficial leadership. So it makes me think about, you know, how I carry myself and how I act at events and things. And even when I'm tired and grumpy, I try to be as friendly as I can, or I try to, you know, if I really don't want to talk, I try to bow out of conversations like as politely and gracefully as I can, instead of just being like, like, no, I don't want to talk or things like that. And I, you know, try to have as much of a persona of, of like friendliness and helpfulness as I can, even if I'm not feeling it, because I think it's really important that, you know, that I do that, that I am friendly to people who feel, if someone feels comfortable enough to talk to me and come to me, then I think it's really important that I interact with that person. So I think it is important that we think about how, you know, how we are viewed in the community. I'm not sure, like, my, my thoughts haven't been finished on this, but like, we only have a minute. Um, when you started talking about, um, you asked us a question, have you ever experienced an, or witnessed a uh, hurtful interaction in open source and in Drupal especially? Um, I, I did, I mean, I was thinking, of course, no matter how well your code of conduct is, and no matter how well you um, make focus focus on guarding that, there will of course always be like people that do that. And, um, you can kick them out after the first happening, but you will always, always, always have that. So I was just thinking like you are asking for the worst experiences because I do I, I have experienced those things but overall I do feel very welcome in the end like it turned for me it turned out in the end so I just wanted to I guess focus on that like it's not all bad there are bad things but luckily there is still a very big part of this community that is welcoming and that is respectful. So yeah, I guess I just would like to add that. No, I think that's so important and it's a good point that, you know, hopefully the good always cancels out the bad but I think part of it is also making sure that we can get rid of as much of the bad as we can you know if everyone is focused on being as welcoming and as inclusive as possible and everyone is thinking about being you know the most polite the most welcoming the most kind that they can be then we can cut down on as much of the you know the rudeness the dismissiveness the bad behavior as we can and everyone you know if everyone were on their best behavior all the time you know because there are people who have had one really bad experience and it has ruined them for them. You know, they've left the community, they haven't felt welcomed. So if we can cut down on that and just 
make the community as, as good as it can be. Because then when that person tweets about it and someone else sees it, and then they're not going to join our community. So it's kind of things like that, like how are people seeing our community? How are they perceiving it? Because they're going to perceive it through, you know, if they're going to perceive it through the eyes of someone who had a bad experience, then that reflects really badly and we can't fix that. So if we can just start fixing it at the root and say like, this is who we are, this is the kind of people we are, we are kind, nice, welcoming people, we are helpful, we are good, then, you know, we can just, People are going to be people. People are going to have bad days. People are going to be mean. It's going to happen. But if we can just come from a point of view of, of hoping that none of that happens, I think we can really make ourselves better. So, yeah, I, I agree with you uh, 100%, of course. Um, there's one more issue in my mind. I'm uh, a pretty insecure person, like, and it doesn't show. Cause I, I, it's kind of like there, and I'm like, okay, I see you insecurity, but I'm not going to do a lot with you because it doesn't help me. But I do feel it, so I understand from that perspective what that's like. And if I'm like a new person and I, um, and I see a project and I read the code of conduct and it's like really strict on like, we have to be nice, we have to do this, we have to do that. And I'm like, oh my God, what if I have a bad day? What if I say the wrong thing? Are they going to be okay with me being human? <laughs> you know? So I think it's important to also um, kind of like let people feel that we're all human and we, we, there's room for that, that's okay. Yeah. That's an interesting point, and one I hadn't really thought about, that people would feel pressured to be too nice, but I'll have to think about that. I hadn't really thought about it. Okay, one last question, because we're running out of time. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, was, I, I only saw the last part, but I, what I saw, I really liked. Uh, maybe one, <clears throat> one thing that I observed is we had, for example, the, the local <coughs> Drupal Association leaders meeting this week, and I think I counted two women and uh, like 20 men. So while I see a lot of diverse leadership already in Drupal, I think especially when it comes to the local associations that I know, we have a uh, way to go, and I think it would be nice yeah, if we found ways to collaborate to improve the diversity of leadership in our local communities. I agree 100%. Okay, thank you everyone. I think the next session is coming in.